In this video, we're going to talk about the topic of evolution or change in uh, a species population over a long, gradual period of time generally. Uh, this is IB 5.4, and we're going to combine it with our other topics uh, within evolution for our, our evolution units. And the first thing we want to do is really define the topic of evolution um, and what that means. And a good definition to base, um, to base this off of is the cumulative change in the heritable characteristics of a population. And what that means, to simplify it a little bit further, is we're really looking at how a population's allele frequencies, or the frequency of how often different alleles are occurring, um, if that changes in a population over a period of time, then we can say that that population is experiencing biological evolution. It's really just simplifying it down to the, the meaning that there's a change in a population over a period of time. And this is based off of descent with modification. Uh, genes and DNA and traits are inherited from parents, at least in um, uh, both in asexual and sexual reproduction. It occurs uh, in a population of a species, but not in an individual. It's very important to remember that when we're talking about evolution, uh, we are specifically talking about change in a population, not an individual. And it results, uh, it's a result of different selection pressures in the environment. And there's some condi conditions necessary uh, for change, the first being variation. Members of species show variation, um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. There's an overproduction of offspring, meaning that populations tend to produce more offspring than the environment can support. And there's a, a change in environmental conditions that, that cause those selection pressures to change. So those are kind of the three main things that we're going to look at um, that cause or, or um, force populations to change. We'll look at those in a little more detail. Um, if we were to, to kind of diagram all of this, um, overproduction of offspring, variation of traits within a population, um, some individuals have traits that, that give them a higher probability or a better chance of survival. Um, and thus, in surviving, they reproduce and pass on their genes to hopefully reproducing offspring. Um, we call that fitness. And then some um, individuals are able to survive better uh, than others. And so it can lead to, that can lead to a accumulation of favorable traits in a population. All of those combine to drive this um, selection factor called natural selection. And natural selection is really the driving force for evolution. And our good friend Charles Darwin um, is, is kind of the creator behind the idea of natural selection, that populations change based off, based off of these different um, combining factors. So let's first talk about variation. Where does it come from? Um, obviously, we've got uh, some cats here, and, and kittens have a wide variety of variation. Where does that variation come from? Well, really, to break it down, it's pretty much coming from sex. Um, through sexual reproduction, uh, different uh, mechanisms that happen really increase the variation within a population. And a lot of that uh, is primarily coming from meiosis through crossing over, in which um, portions of homologous chromosomes can actually exchange a location so in order to mix up different alleles. Um, for example, we see here some different allele combinations because of crossing over. Uh, genetic recombination, the um, selection of, of different uh, chromatids that actually end up going into the gametes is very random. Uh, there's a, a, thousands of different combinations in humans because we have 23 chromosome pairs. And so that results in a huge variety of different combination possibilities, increasing genetic diversity. And then it's random fertilization. Um, in humans and in most other species, uh, thousands of sperm are produced in the male and females have um, a, a, a huge number of eggs. And it's random which of those are actually gonna go on to become an offspring. And so because of that, there's just so many different random possibilities combinations of different genes or alleles that it really increases the, the genetic variation. If you look at humans, for example, we have a wide range of, of hair color and eye color and skin color, just to look at a few. Other species are the same way. Um, and oftentimes it's well beyond just what we can see in terms of physical traits, but there's also variation in terms of um, body mass or internal uh, components and structures of the organism. So what happens when there are too many babies? Uh, for example, rabbits like to produce a lot, um, and in situations, generally, uh, organisms um, will produce more babies than the environment can support. And so uh, rabbits, for example, have some babies and have some more and more and more and more, and this continues on, and we just get lots and lots of offspring. Well, unfortunately, the environment cannot support all of these offspring. And so what happens when there's too many, um, too many babies, too many offspring? 
Um, for example, if there's lots of resources available, the population is going to increase. Resources being food, uh, space, um, everybody can find a mate, um, shelter. Uh, these resources are available, and so the population is going to increase. Population is eventually going to reach its carrying capacity uh, of the environment. And what that means is the population is going to get to a size where it's um, the environment can only support, because of resources, the availability of resources, the environment can only support such a size. And so the population will eventually reach that carrying capacity. And as the population continues to increase, there's going to be too many individuals. So there's going to be actually more individuals. Uh, we're going to be over that carrying capacity. And because there's variation that exists within the population, some individuals within that species are going to be able to survive better than others. Um, for example, uh, rabbits might, uh, they do have different fur color, um, different shades of fur color, and maybe for whatever reason, uh, one particular type of that fur color is going to help those rabbits to blend in with their environments rather than others. Maybe a darker color helps them to blend in than a lighter color. And so because of that, they're harder to catch by predators, and thus they survive. And the weaker individuals, not in terms of physical strength, but in terms of their genes being fit for the environment, are not going to be able to survive to pass on their traits. And so really all of this boils down to the struggle for survival. Life is not very easy. Humans have it pretty easy, but for most other species, life's not very easy, and there's a struggle for survival through competition, uh, for resources, and because there's an overproduction of, of, of offspring, um, there's a struggle for survival, and those that have traits that are better fit, meaning that they, the traits uh, help them to survive in, in their environment, um, are going to survive to hopefully reproduce and pass on those, those alleles and those genes to their offspring, who then do the same if they are fit for the environment. So looking at this, um, it's kind of a, a combination of all these different things that's resulting in natural selection. It's overproduction of offspring, variation, inheritance, competition, and time is going to result in natural selection. So here's a, a, a quick example uh, from UC Berkeley. So let's say, for example, we've got a population of birds here, and they eat beetles, and green beetles happen to be their favorites. Uh, in this population, there's some different colors, some variation in terms of the beetles. And so the birds are eating these beetles, and they continue to eat the green beetles because that's, uh, they're both present, and that's what the birds prefer. And eventually, over multiple generations, we're going to see that there won't be any green beetles left in that population because they being the green alleles are not fit for the for the environment because the predators birds are eating those and so as a result the population is going to shift or change because of natural selection to this uh, orange or red color um, because because of this variation and because uh, predators are selecting the green alleles those green alleles are going to be removed from the population so let's take a look at some of the uh, data that that scientists have collected in order to, um, that that supports this this idea of change um, and the idea of natural selection and evolution. Um, and the fossil record is really where we can get a lot of that information. Uh, and a great example of that is looking at horse uh, species and ancestors. Now, it'd be kind of hard to see in this video, but um, ancestors of modern day horses uh, were much smaller and they had some different characteristics in terms of their hoof. Um, being that prime, uh, this, this ancestor here had a hoof that had kind of four um, different uh, kind of hoof shaped um, in order to, to move around and walk in their environment. At the time it was a very marshy, uh, more wet environment and so having this four hoof shape uh, allowed them and helped them to move in that environment. As that environment changes we see some changes in the fossil record and, and this progresses um, from a four hoof shape to what we see today in a single hoof shape. The important thing to remember that is that this is not just a straight linear progression. Uh, we can see all these other branching lines in these different boxes here, and some of these lines end. Those are different species of, of organisms that were, are related to modern day horses, and some of them are extinct. Most of them are extinct now. Um, but it's not this straight, gradual line from ancestors to modern day horses. And what the fossil record is showing us is similarities and differences, and it indicates relatedness of present day and extinct organisms. And so we can use that to, to see how species are changing um, over time, and, and, and see how they're uh, developing or adapting to the particular environments at the time. The second um, 
the source of, of evidence that we have that's really uh, helpful is selective breeding. For a long time, humans have always bred uh, wild organisms uh, to produce offspring with the most desirable traits. And a great example of that is dogs. Uh, modern day dogs are primarily derived from different wolf uh, or ancestors of wolves um, and through selective breeding for specific traits, uh, primarily being actually able to approach humans and, and trusting humans, um, but then uh, different hunting abilities or different workmanship abilities. By selectively breeding wolves um, or ancestors of wolves, that is how modern day dogs have been produced. Another great example is the uh, selective breeding of different crops. For example, corn. If you are growing corn, as Native Americans did, and you want to get the most, most corn, uh, the most food possible, in replanting seeds for the following season, you're going to take seeds from uh, an individual that has the biggest kernel in order to get the most food. And so by doing that, you're selectively um, breeding those individuals that have the best traits, the most desirable traits. And so in the next generation, obviously there's going to continue to be variation, um, but those that uh, have the, the largest kernels you're going to use to reproduce. And then in the next generation, you'll see corn uh, that has larger kernels and cobs. The last uh, evidence for evolution that we're going to look at is homologous structures. And, and this also includes analogous structures and vestigial structures. Homologous structures are those that are similar in function uh, or structure, excuse me, they're similar in structure, position, or development, and that's because of a common ancestor. Um, for example, uh, humans and dogs and whales uh, and even birds to some degree share some, some strong similarities in the arrangement of their arm bone structure. We can see that they all have these similar um, bone structures and, and that's because they're due to a common ancestor. Obviously humans are going to be more close, closely related to dogs and whales because we're both we're all mammals. Birds not as closely related but we still have some similar features in our bone arm structure. Um, and, and this is due to or because of a common ancestor and by looking at um, fossils and by looking at the bone structures of modern day species we can see this. Uh, the opposite of that is analogous structures and this is uh, structures that are similar in function but they're different in the fundamental structure and they're not from a common ancestor. So for example uh, if we look at a bird's wing and an insect's wing they are both used for the same function i.e. flight uh, but they do not share a common ancestor. Birds and insects are not closely related and so these uh, similar structures that we see are due to select, similar selective pressures in the environment, but they are not due to a common ancestor. We're going to finish up this video by looking at a couple of examples of evolution um, that we've been able to actually see in the real world. Um, and that first being, uh, first example is the uh, change in stickleback fish. Stickleback uh, can be found in Alaska and Washington and, and parts of Oregon as well sometimes. And uh, in this example, and what we saw happen is um, early on uh, in Alaska, um, in Loberg Lake, um, the stickleback were removed from that lake because they didn't provide any, uh, they really didn't provide any benefit. Um, they were kind of um, bas basically, uh, in the way, kind of pest in, in, in the lake environment. And so uh, Fish and Game Department poisoned the lake to remove the stickleback. Um, stickleback can be found in both the ocean, marine environment, or freshwater lake environment. And one, uh, when that lake was originally poisoned, it wiped out all the stickleback. And somehow, some stickleback uh, made their way back to this lake uh, a number of years later. And marine stickleback, or those that are found in the ocean, have uh, a lot of body armor, essentially. They have these uh, spikes here, and they have uh, some body armor here. And that's to protect them um, from uh, larger fish or, or predators in the ocean. Um, and when these fish were, uh, when the fish actually got to the, the, the fresh water lake, um, over a number of generations we saw some changes. And those changes are primarily the loss of some of this body armor right here because in the freshwater lake it's not advantageous to have that body armor. It slows the fish down and it actually increases the possibility of the um, uh, fry fish, the young fish, to be caught by predators. And so over just 13 generations we actually can measure and saw this stickleback uh, fish variety uh, 
species change and develop to fit or be better fit for its variation. And this is all possible because of variation within the species, um, production of offspring, um, and, and competition and, and predators over a gradual period of time. So that's one example of, of how we've seen and measured um, evolution in real species in our lifetime.